Hi, everyone, and welcome to Learn Your Radiology. I'm Brent Weinberg. This is lecture six in the Emergent Imaging of Brain Tumors series. We've talked about a lot of the different tumors that can occur in the brain, how you might approach them on CT and in the emergence setting. Now we're going to talk about some of the common mimics that you need to be aware of so that you don't get fooled and so you can give a smart differential diagnosis or for some things that are going to look like a tumor, maybe but don't end up being a tumor. As I said, we've talked about kind of the role of imaging, some of the common tumors. On this lecture, we're going to focus on the mimics that you might see. Now, the most common things you're going to run into are infection. Uh, so like a diffuse infection, like a virus. I've separated abscess out here separately. Those are going to be encapsulated parenchymal infections. Uh, so be aware of those. And demyelinating disease is also a key thing that can mimic a brain tumor. Our case here, we have a 46-year-old with cough and altered mental status. All right, here we have some images from a CT. They don't look that abnormal, but this altered patient, if you look at the left anterior temporal lobe, maybe it's a little bit hypodense, maybe it's a little bit swollen. You might see a little medialization of the uncus there. Here you see kind of the same things on our adjacent CT slice. A little bit of swelling of the medial left temporal lobe, a little bit of edema, a little bit of subtle expansion. When you see that, your primary differential is going to be that there's encephalitis or primary tumor. Uh, the thing that you have to worry about particularly is HIV encephalitis. Uh, stroke. Uh, that definitely is possible, but the distribution here, it doesn't, it's not really the perfect for stroke. And then also the patient doesn't have the clinical syndrome coming in for stroke, making that a little bit less likely. You want this patient to get an MRI. You want them to get a lumbar puncture. Our impression is going to be that there's subtle edema and mass effect of the left temporal lobe. We're going to recommend an MRI for further evaluation. Maybe LP, particularly if they're clinically concerned about infection, they can go ahead and get that started as well. Now here we see the, see the MRI. And the medial temporal lobe there, a lot of T2 hyperintense swelling, much more obvious on the T2 compared to the CT. On diffusion, it's very bright, involves the amygdala, hippocampus, um, medial temporal lobe here, maybe a little bit of extension up into the insula. We can see on this coronal flare, again, uh, kind of swelling, loss of gray-white differentiation. Looks kind of similar to that astrocytoma we saw in a previous case. When uh, we have pre and post contrast here, a little bit of intrinsic T1 hyperintensity, but tons of enhancement, okay? Solid nodular enhancement of that medial temporal lobe, and even a little bit of involvement of the left, uh, I mean, of the contralateral side. So you see kind of both basal ganglia are involved here. That's definitely concerning. We want to raise the possibility of infection here. The extent of enhancement really is beyond even the extent of the swelling. That really raises the probability of infection here. Uh, this was a case of herpes encephalitis. Herpes encephalitis is a viral encephalitis that really favors the medial temporal lobes, can be unilateral, can be bilateral, particularly in the active stage, it will often enhance, but doesn't have to enhance. Uh, urgent treatment with acyclovir is warranted, and like you really should uh, get them queued up to do that you know, at your earliest sign of suspicion for that. The temporal involvement, the acute signs of infection, the fact that it doesn't follow vascular distribution and it has rapid progression, these are all things that should make you think of encephalitis, like particularly over tumor. So just be aware of that. That's a nice red flag for you to look out for. If you don't find a cause but uh, viral etiology is suspected, these patients definitely need a 6 to 12 week MRI follow-up. A lot of times we see these patients referred back and it looks the same or perhaps a little bit worse. Then you have to be suspicious that it was a tumor. Uh, so that's particularly if they don't get clinically better and if they don't have imaging improvement uh, pretty immediately. So here we have a case of a 52-year-old man found down, altered mental status for eight days. Uh, you can see on this CT sign, uh, the patient's crooked. They'll call that the crooked patient sign. You know a patient's not doing so well if they can't get their head straight long enough for a CT. Uh, let's take a look at these images here. All right, so we see like a lot, a lot going on here. Uh, we'll scroll back through here. In the frontal lobe, we've got a lot of edema. Uh, some, some of it looks vasogenic, maybe a little bit involves the cortex. Uh, as we get towards the center here, maybe we see an actual mass, like the outline of a mass with some central necrosis there. Crosses vascular territory, so we're not necessarily thinking about this being uh, an infarct because you've got ACA and MCA territory involved there with a, a kind of central mass uh, in that location. Uh, here we just see some additional CT images from uh, that CT. Again, kind of a mass. Uh, this is an oblique coronal here. Uh, again, a mass there, centrally necrotic, peripheral hypo, hypodensity. Uh, so we're definitely definitely worried about that. 
RCT findings, a left frontal mass, looks like a necrotic mass with surrounding edema, lots of mass effect. Our differential, we think about primary tumors, we think about metastatic disease. We want to get an MRI, we want to work this up for malignancy. Uh, There's a left frontal necrotic mass, primary tumor, metastatic disease suspected, get an MRI. Uh, so we're going to also consider a workup for systemic malignancy, right? Because this could be, could be a MET. Now on our MRI, we have flare. Uh, so we see uh, flare, hyperintense lesions, movement here again. But you see that rim of hypointensity uh, sort of centrally within that mass there. On T2, we see much of the same, a dark rim. Uh, we see a little bit of blood products there uh, on a gradient imaging. Uh, so again, kind of confirms what we've seen on CT. Here's our pre and post contrast. A little bit of T1 hyperintensity within that rim there, but pretty avid enhancement around the rim. Kind of a heterogeneous but complete rim of enhancement there. Uh, now here we see diffusion, and this is where uh, the clues get a little bit more specific. On DWI, the central necrotic portions of this look very hyperintense. This is the ADC, very dark here. So we have a peripherally enhancing mass, centrally necrotic, where this center region is diffusely abnormal on diffusion. Uh, that should trigger some, uh, some things in your mind, particularly intracranial abscess. So these are areas of intracranial infection that are walled off, that have pus centrally. Some clues you might see, you might see that T2 dark kind of thick wall. You might see peripheral enhancement that's a little thinner towards the ventricle, but the real clue is central diffusion restriction. So if you see a mass that's centrally necrotic and has central diffusion restriction, about an abscess, red flags you might want to be on the lookout for, immunocompromise, systemic and signs of infection and rapid onset. These patients tend to be uh, pretty sick, like they tend to have pretty rapid onset of these symptoms. Uh, the presence of any other systemic infection, you know, dental disease, uh, you know, sepsis fever, like those kinds of things, they can also clue you in that you might be looking at an abscess. We have another case here. It's a 57-year-old woman, right-sided weakness and cognitive impairment. I'm going to scroll through this CT for you. All right, so we see in that left parietal lobe, we've got an area, a lot of edema, looks kind of mass-like, looks like there is some sparing of the cortex, so it looks like mostly vasogenic edema. Unlike that last case, it looks similar overall, but we don't have that central kind of mass-like effect in the middle. Um, all right, so we've got a, got a mass there. Uh, we're going to take a look. A couple additional images here. Again, you see that mass-like expansion, vasogenic edema, left parietal lobe pretty expanded. So we see it's pretty mass-like. We are suspicious that there's an underlying mass, lots of mass effect. We didn't see a distinct mass like that previous case. Again, though, our differential, we're thinking about primary tumors. We're thinking about metastatic disease, particularly in this lecture about tumors. We're going to recommend an MRI, work up for malignancy again, because metastatic disease is a primary consideration there. Here, our CT impression, we have extensive left parietal vasogenic edema, mass effect, but not a discrete mass. We think about primary tumors. We're thinking about metastatic disease. Get the MRI and the, uh, the uh, systemic malignancy workup started. So here's some images from the MRI. Looks a little different from that MRI that we just saw, right? So we have a flare, pretty well-defined margins, kind of centrally. Have a little, uh, a little bit of T2 uh, mismatch uh, with the flare here, uh, kind of dropping out a little bit here. On diffusion, however, unlike that previous case, we have a diffusion abnormality, but it's clearly following the periphery of the lesion. So the distribution of the diffusion is different. Now in pre and post contrast, we'll see the distribution of contrast enhancement is also different. So here's our pre contrast. Again, we see that mass like lesion there. Here we see kind of ill-defined enhancement predominantly along the margins of the lesion, but it's not a complete rim of enhancement. Doesn't look like a well-defined abscess like that previous case. This is a case of too effective demyelination. Now, this is a variant of demyelinating disease in patients that have a single large lesion. It's kind of on the spectrum of other demyelinating diseases, including multiple sclerosis and uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. The red flags you might see are sudden onset. You might see it in young, uh, young female patients, uh, but in many cases, it's going to be indistinguishable from a tumor on CT. The MR clues that tell you are that leading edge of enhancement and abnormal diffusion along the margins that really clue you in that you might be looking at demyelination. In summary, we have our mimics, like, and we have to think that there are non-tumor lesions that can masquerade as tumors. Systemic signs or clinical features might point you in that direction. So if someone has systemic signs of infection, you might be thinking about uh, whether it could be an abscess. In many cases, the CT features 
numbers are going to be impossible to distinguish. So your differential on CT is like not going to be right necessarily because you're not thinking about tumor factor demyelination and something that looks like a tumor. However, the important thing is to get them to that MRI, which is the next step, describe the mass effect and the other features that you see. Uh, CT really is just going to be wrong sometimes though. Like I said, tumor workup uh, with MRI, systemic workup is really what's going to lead to the answer. So thanks for tuning in to this sixth lecture in the Emergent Brain Tumor Series about mimics. Be sure to tune in for the last video, which is going to talk about some red flags and complications that you might see. Uh, that's going to wrap up the Emergent Brain Tumor Series. Be sure to like the video. Be sure to subscribe and see the rest of the videos on the channel. And check us out at LearnNeuroRadiology.com. Thanks for tuning in today.